Before we get into today's video, I do wanna let you guys know that this video is for entertainment purposes only. Please remember to be kind to everybody everywhere in your everyday life, in your home, in the grocery store, and especially in the comment section down below. Please do not show hate to anybody anywhere. Good morning, my lovelies, my beauties, my friends. My name is Christina and welcome to my channel. If you're new here, thank you so much for clicking on this video. I really hope that you will subscribe, stick around, take a chance and hearing some things that I have to say. And if you are a returning subscriber, Y'all already know, uh, y'all are my babies. So good morning, good morning, good morning. How is everybody doing today? I hope you all are having an amazing day. So today I'm gonna be doing the very, 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 very highly requested the Menendez Brothers story. Now, hear me out real quick. My plan for today's video is I am going to just very briefly, as briefly as I can, y'all know I'm long-winded, go over the Menendez Brothers story and then I wanna spend way more time talking about other details and my opinions on things than just the story. You guys can watch the whole entire trial here on, well, not the whole entire trial here on YouTube. You can watch most of it. I will leave a link down below for Court TV so you can watch the whole entire trial if you would like. Also, I planned on putting this video out sooner than now, but while I was watching the trial, I actually saw that Kendall Ray, like literally, if you see right here, I screenshotted it, put out a video while I was watching one of the boys speak and I was like, oh, I'm gonna push it back a couple weeks so it's not on top of her video. So um, I did see that her video is an hour long. I did not watch it though because I did not want it to interfere with what I'm going to be doing here, but I will leave her video linked down below too so you guys go and watch her video as well. So before we go any further in today's video, I did want to stop and thank today's sponsor, ExpressVPN. Thank you so much, ExpressVPN, for sponsoring today's video. If you do not know what a VPN is, it is a virtual private network and let me tell you what, ExpressVPN has helped me unblock certain content that I would not typically be able to see. Did you know that some other countries in their Netflix like libraries, they have almost twice as many Oscar winning movies that we do over here in the US? Uh, yes. And I don't know about y'all, but I love to watch movies and shows and crime documentaries, but we're gonna get to that in just a second. Also, I'm so thankful for ExpressVPN because they help me keep my privacy safe. You would not go to a public restroom and leave the door wide open, would you, and let people just walk in and see you while you're doing your business? No, you want your privacy. Well, that's what it's like when you surf the internet or the web and you don't have ExpressVPN. Like people can see all what you're searching at, see your search history. But my favorite way to use ExpressVPN is to be able to unlock shows that I'm not typically able to see over here. Like, let me show you real quick. Okay, here you can see I'm on the US VPN and on Netflix, when I try to look up the show Psychopath, it's not available to me. All I gotta do is come over here and switch my VPN to the UK and boop, it pops up. And you guys, this is the episode with Paris Bennett. It is so good. If y'all have not seen it yet, you have to watch it. Do you guys remember when I did the story time on Paris Bennett? Well, that documentary that I just showed you, the interview with the psychopath, there's only six minutes of that here on YouTube. You can watch the whole entire episode on Netflix, but if you're in the UK, not if you're in the US, until I had ExpressVPN, now I'm able to watch the whole entire thing, which I love. I am so thankful for ExpressVPN. You guys, if you want to find out how you can get three months free of ExpressVPN, just click the link down in the description box at expressvpn.com forward slash Christina Randall. Thank you again, ExpressVPN, for sponsoring today's video. Now, all right, back to the story. So, if you guys do not know the story about the Menendez brothers, there were two brothers, they were 18 and 21. They lived in Beverly Hills, lived the rich life. And I'm gonna tell you guys the story briefly, but they ended up shooting and murdering their parents back in 1989. I mean, cold blood, we're talking about <laughs> shotguns, honey. Like, I mean, not to be funny or anything, but if you guys don't know anything about them kind of weapons, they make a mess. It don't matter what you're firing it at. So, I mean, it was a grisly scene and it was a huge, huge, huge deal. 
The boys did end up getting sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. And during the trial, which was, I think, one of the first televised trials that they did, O.J. Simpson started right around the same time as their trial, too. But we'll get more to that anyways later. It was highly televised. A lot of stuff came out. And I'm just going to tell you guys now, spoiler alert, because I know I'm going to make some people mad in this video. I don't believe their story. I don't, and I'm going to tell you guys why. However... I don't believe that they should be in prison either. So, hmm, how does that pan out? Where well, you're going to have to wait and watch the video to see. Don't unsubscribe yet. I know how some of y'all are. I love y'all. You love me. Okay, let's start at the beginning. Eric and Lyle's father was Jose Menendez, who was born in 1944 in Cuba. He was actually born to a very well-to-do family or a rich family down there in Cuba. His parents were very well known. His mother was a champion swimmer. His father was a champion football player, which was actually what we would call soccer, but they called it football down there. So he grew up with both of his parents, very athletic. His dad owned an accounting firm, so they were not hurting for money down in Cuba. However, Jose ended up moving to the United States. Jose had two sisters growing up, and he was known as actually a bully. He was mama's little boy, though. He was precious mama's little boy and daddy's pride and joy, but he was a bully. He played sports as well in Cuba, and he was very handsome, very charismatic, but also some people really loved him, and some people really did not like him. He was abrasive. He kind of pushed people around, and he was just known for being a bully. When he was 16 years old, his parents sent him here to America because of the revolution in Cuba. And when he moved here, he moved in with his cousin and lived in his cousin's attic. Like that's all he came here by himself to a whole new country, lived in his cousin's attic, and then eventually started going to high school here in the States. While going to high school, he excelled in sports as well. And he got a full scholarship to college. So he was already hitting the ground running when he got here. He was known as a high achiever. I mean, he, he came here living in an attic and got a full scholarship. And anyways, as a high achiever, would do anything it takes to get anything that he wants, and so he started going to college. While Jose was in college, that is where he met Kitty, who would later become Kitty Menendez. Now, Kitty did not grow up in the best atmosphere when, when she was a child. She had an abusive father. She just had a lot of issues growing up, but when she went to college and she met Jose, they fell madly in love. Kitty was very much known for her looks. She was beautiful. She was actually even a beauty queen um, winner. She did pageants and stuff like that. Her brother would later say that she was just as beautiful on the inside as she was on the outside. Kitty had really big dreams. She wanted to be an actress or a model and travel and, and just, she had stars in her eyes. In 1963, when Jose and Kitty were 19 and 21, Kitty being the 21 year old, they eloped and they got married. Married. They eventually moved to New York where Kitty got a job as a teacher and Jose was a dishwasher. So, I mean, like he's starting from the bottom, bottom, bottom. While he was a dishwasher, he did go to school to be an accountant, what I thought was pretty ironic because his dad owned an accounting firm down in Cuba. So he's following in his father's footsteps, right? And then that's when Kitty becomes pregnant. Kitty became pregnant in 1968 with their first son, Jose Lyle Menendez. And that is Lyle from Lyle. Lyle and Eric. His actual first name is Jose. He was named after his father and he was already when he was born and she found out she was pregnant going to be his daddy's pride and joy and follow exactly in his father's footsteps. Now, Kitty allegedly did not want to have kids. She never wanted to be pregnant. She never wanted to be a mom, according to her sons who would later testify in court. Just explain all the things that she could have been an actress, broadcasting. She told me that she had a job in New York to be a hostess at a restaurant that she said she could make almost 50000 a year. Then suddenly she had gotten pregnant, that she had not wanted to get pregnant, that my dad had then forced her. Well, gave her an ultimatum, either you leave or or you stay home with my son. And Kitty at this point, who has already married him, they're married, she loves him, she's moved to New York with him, decides that, okay, I'll stay home and I'll be, you know, the housewife and take care of our son. 
Almost three years later, in 1970, Kitty becomes pregnant with their second child, which is a boy as well, and this is Eric Menendez. Not long after Eric is born, Jose gets a job with a record label where he is making a lot of money. I mean, you guys, he goes from being living in an attic, being a dishwasher, to now working for this record label, and the reason why he, he jumped from these different businesses is because Jose was known to be very cutthroat. I mean, there was even rumors rumors that went around that different people at his businesses always would say that worked with him that were co-workers they would always say make sure you have an alibi make sure you have an alibi because they would all joke about who was going to kill him because he was just so he would fire you in a heartbeat he was rude he was abrasive he was very pushy with everything he was also overly flirtatious and, and touchy kind of feely with the women and made them feel uncomfortable. He was just that guy. However, he was really, really, really good at his job and made whatever company that he worked for a lot of money, which is why they kept him and he was so successful financially. As the boys grew up, they went to the best schools, the best private schools. They lived in the nicest houses. I mean, they had it all materialistically. Now this is a right around the time while the boys were in school that where Kitty started to drink and take medication. At first it is said that she started taking medication that was like, you know, prescribed to her, maybe depression pills and stuff like that. But later down the road, she would end up taking a lot more. It is said that Kitty was never fulfilled. She did not want to be home changing diapers. She didn't want to be home playing soccer mom and taking the kids this where this place and that place while her husband was a successful businessman. Although she did like living this life, she wanted more and she was just really unhappy. However, it is also said that Jose was abusive to her too. He beat her, he cussed at her, he yelled at her. He, she was scared of him. She loved him, but she was scared of him at the same time. While the boys were young, they started to play sports. They had to play sports because their dad made them. Their dad, I mean, he come from a long line of athletes. His boys, they were going to be swimmers like him and his family was, or they were going to be something. They started playing tennis. They, they swam. Lyle would later testify that they had to practice every single day and even on the weekends. And when a lawyer asks Lyle in court, how many hours a week did you practice sports? He said 45. That's on a school day, on a school week too. So he would go to school all day and then, you know, seven, eight years old, he would have to go practice for four or five hours. It was also said that any time that they went to play games or whatever, like say it was a tennis game, if the boys lost, it was all broke loose at home. And even if they won, their dad would never just congratulate them and be like, good job, you won. Even though both of his boys were always the star players. They were always great, great, great players. The boys never felt like they were good players because no matter what happened, whether they won or lost, their dad would always pick apart the things they could have done better. So say they win the championship. He's like, okay, you won the championship, but you know, next time you need to not do this, not do this, not do this, not do this. So the boys could need even see how good they were even though they were the best. Coaches would later testify that their dad, Jose, was basically a nightmare dad. You know, the ones that are at the, some of y'all's kids play sports, the one that's yelling the whole time, the one snatching their kid up by their by their helmet or whatever and tell it he was that guy times 10. To Jose, reputation was everything. It didn't matter, you know, really what the boys did. He wanted to have the best reputation. He wanted everybody to think they had it all together. And they did look like they had it all together. From their pictures, from their homes, from the cars that they drove, they looked like they were the living the all-American dream. But behind closed doors, things were really dark and disturbing. Kitty found out that Jose was having an affair with a woman that lived in New York and they had had an affair for eight years and she was a well-kept mistress too, honey. She wasn't just no seed on the weekends. He was paying for everything for her up there and she was devastated. And I could only imagine how she felt now back there in the, you know, 1980s and she is completely sent on her husband, right? Like he's taking care of everything and now she finds out and he's beating her, yelling at her, treating her like crap. She's got these two kids that she really don't even want to have, okay? She wants to be 
doing movies or modeling or something. And now she finds out he's got a mistress up in New York and she loses her doggone mind. Right around this time, Jose gets a new job. And this is about 1986. The boys are, they're teenagers. They're getting older now. He gets a new job as a corporate executive. And this is a big time job. But for this job, he's got to move to Beverly Hills. Now it is said that he tried to talk Kitty into staying in Calabasas because that's where they were living at this time. Stay in Calabasas with the boys and I'm going to move to Beverly Hills. She's like, oh no, you're not going without me, especially without these two little brats. <laughs> I'm just kidding. She probably didn't say that, but that's how the vision that I get of her. Like, uh-uh, you ain't leaving me over here with them. You better take these boys. They, they, they're your, uh-uh. Remember you wanted them? No, I'm just kidding. But anyways, so he finally agrees because he already, and he didn't usually let Kitty push him around, but she done found out about the affair. He didn't want nothing to ruffle his, you know, image. So he took them and the kids and they moved into this $4 million mansion. Back in the 1980s, that'd be like a $16 million mansion now. I mean, they was, they had it, they had a lot of money. So they move into this big giant mansion. It is later said that... Their mother was, and I get that. Well, she, nobody said this. This is the image that I get. I think Kitty resented the boys. I think she did. The boys would later testify that she would do things like she would burn the food almost every single time. She'd be taking so many pills and drinking so much that she would burn the food. Eric said that he came downstairs one time. Well, multiple times he said this happened and the whole entire kitchen is billowing with smoke and like, he's like trying to get her, Hey, you need to come put the fire out. And she's like, you know, whatever. But more, almost every time she at least burned the food. They would also testify that when the boys went to sports and it was Kitty's job to pick them up and drop them off, she was almost always late. Sometimes they would sit there for hours in the dark, you know, on the bench, swinging their rackets, waiting for their mom to get there. She would come pulling up, skirting up, you know, whatever. There'd be different times where like she would pick them up from school to take them to tennis practice and she forgot their rackets. Well, if they didn't have their rackets and they had to borrow them and it was just like this whole entire mess and she would blame it on the boys. There was different testimonies that she would make Eric because she was, she was closer to Eric and Jose was closer to his oldest, which was Jose Lyle or Lyle. And she would make Eric, you know, stay in her closet and do his schoolwork over and over and over again. And she would leave the house and leave him in the closet. And she would put like this little piece of paper at the door to make sure he didn't open the door. And if he opened the door, the paper would fall. And then he would got to the point where he had to use the bathroom. So she would like give him something to pee in, in the closet. Like who does this to their kids? Okay. So I think she, she grew to resent her children. And, uh, it, she cursed a lot and uh, I'll wait till your dad gets home I'll tell him the things that you didn't do today and and uh, I wish you were never born and why can't you be like your brother and what's the matter with you and, and then I would try to say something she would say shut up I don't want to hear it no, you're stupid I hate you uh, how old were you when you heard things like I wish you were never born Seven. In 1987, Eric started going to Princeton High School, which was like a very, very big deal. And he was an exceptional tennis player. I mean, he was like number 44 in the whole entire country of people that are under 18. But he thought that he sucked because he was never good enough. His dad, no matter what happened, his dad, even when he, I think he was like number one in his county or his district or whatever and his dad still gave him no praise no pats on the back for all of his hard work for his 45 50 hours of work of practicing every week he never once complimented him about it because it was just never good enough at this point lyle who is the older brother was going to princeton university that was terrible the very first year the freshman year that he was there he got put on academic probation for not having very good grades and then he later got suspended for a full entire year because he plag plagiarized something so the boys this is it the boys got in trouble they did things there was different times where 
you know, the boys, they, they broke into people's houses in these rich neighborhoods, which they didn't need to do. They had everything they wanted financially. It was different rumors that went around saying that like the dad and mom, they basically just gave them anything they wanted financially and didn't ever hold them accountable for anything. So they would run the streets and get in trouble. One friend testified that Eric, when he would go to like shopping, if the people weren't paying attention to him, he would jump up on the like the desk where you check out at and start saying, I'm here to buy something. I'm here to buy something. Like, I don't know if that's true, but that's what they testified. So these were some people, they were considered like spoiled brats. They had a lot of money at their fingers and they could do whatever they wanted. They rode limo rides to the school. I mean, not every day, but like if they had an event or whatever, they had these limo rides, they had the best clothes, the best shoes. And the reason why it is said that they were provided all that is because Jose had an image. So if his boys looked good and looked rich, then he looked good and he looked rich. It was not because they loved their boys and they were trying to reward them, you know, for their hard work. It was because it all fell back to the image of the father. Okay, so let's talk about the night of the murder and then we're gonna get on to all the other stuff, okay? The night of the murder was in August of 1989. So we're gonna go, how did we get here? If you don't know the story, you're gonna be like, girl, how did we go from all that to this? But we're, we're gonna get there, okay? 1989, Jose and Kitty were sitting in their den, allegedly just chilling, and the boys busted into that room with the two shotguns and hit, or shot, their dad in the back of the head. And when they did, their mom woke up and then they shot her. And they ended up shooting their mom 10 times. And that is because they said that, or it is said that, she didn't like she she wouldn't die basically she kept trying to like crawl away or one time she got up and tried to run and she slipped in her blood and then when they finally got her shot in the head they um they shot her twice they fired 15 rounds i mean and, and again you guys it was a complete bloodbath i mean there it was a crime scene like whoa they shot them both in the kneecaps allegedly to make it look like like mobsters or whatever because they were going to try to get away with this after they finished their parents off they snuck out of the house they went to the movies and they thought that People, neighbors were going to call the cops because they heard 15 rounds of shotguns going off and then nobody called police in the rich folks' neighborhood. Y'all, they probably thought it was just some fireworks or something like that. I don't know what they thought in Beverly Hills, but honey, around here, we know what a shotgun sounds like. Anyways, they go to the movies and then they're going to do something else. They plan on going to this festival, allegedly. So they're going to come back to the house to get Eric's ID and then that's when they find the bodies. Well, what happened was they came back to the house. They realized the cops hadn't been there. So then they decide to call 911. This is the 911 call right here. Beverly Hills emergency. Yes, please. Uh, What's the problem? What's the problem? What's the problem? Someone killed my parents. Pardon me? Okay, we're on our way over there with an ambulance. Okay, I gotta go. <laughs> okay. 
there, that's Lyle. He is crying and upset and saying, somebody shot my parents. And the cops come. They see the scene. They ask them where they've been. They, they don't want to question the two boys really too much at this time because they... They feel like, okay, they just lost their parents. And also, Jose had a really bad reputation. I mean, it was well known that a lot of people hated him. So they thought, because of them being shot in the kneecaps, that it was probably the mafia or something like that. They did not test the boys' hands for gun residue. They did not search their vehicle. They didn't really do anything. They just trusted them. So, time moves on. At this point, now the investigators are looking for the murderers, and they're not even really having the boys on their radar. The cops would later testify that the boys were not out of out of their view. I think they were. I think that they were just kind of embarrassed because they realized they didn't even really check anything. They didn't check. They didn't check anything. The boys go off, and this is where people start getting really upset. They start spending their parents' money to the tune of within like six months, they spent seven hundred thousand dollars. Which, in back in nineteen eighty nine, seven hundred thousand dollars is a lot of money now. Back in nineteen eighty nine, it was a whole heck of a lot, <laughs> a lot, lot. Okay, they bought like fancy cars, Rolex watches. They went to their parents' funeral, honey, and brand new Rolex watches and brand new like. Gator shoes and the whole nine yards. They bought a business. They bought, you know, they Eric got him a um, a fancy tennis coach to help coach him because he wanted to play tennis. And before you know it, people are starting to look at them like they sure don't look like two boys that are grieving. What ended up happening, how they ended up getting caught at the end of the day is, remember how I told you that they were kind of breaking into houses? Well, they weren't kind of. They were breaking into houses when they were younger. When they got arrested, they had to go to therapy. So they had a therapist. Well, Eric did. Eric started seeing his therapist again. When his therapist found out that his parents were murdered, he reached out to him and said, why don't you come in and talk to me? Eventually, Eric, feeling so guilty about it, confessed the murders to his therapist. Well, his therapist recorded it later. They, he came, got him to come back. He coached him into telling the story again, and then he recorded it. Later, it is alleged that Lyle found out. I mean, Eric told him, okay, I told the therapist. And of course, Lyle's like, you freaking idiot. Like, why would you tell him? And then Eric's like, he can't tell anybody. It's, you know, he's whatever. Lyle goes in there. The therapist said that Lyle threatened him and said that if you tell anybody that we killed our parents, we're going to kill you next. That's what he said. Later on, the therapist mistress that was allegedly in the office at the time went to the police and said that she overheard them confessing and then it opened up the whole entire case, okay? Later on, by the way, that same exact girlfriend or mistress would go back to court and say that completely try to renege the whole entire thing. So basically what happened was Eric confessed to his therapist and it got out that way and they came and arrested him. They arrested Lyle first. And when they arrested, arrested Lyle, Eric was actually in Israel playing tennis. He found out his brother was arrested. He was freaking out. He came back, turned himself in and then they had trial. Boom, that's where we're at. Ugh. In 1993 was the first trial, okay? This was the one that was broadcasted on television, the one that I will link down below. The defense for the boys was that they were, and this is where I'm gonna give you guys the biggest trigger warning ever because I wanna be able to talk almost as freely as I can because there's a lot of details in this. So this is where we're gonna be talking about abuse, SA. We're gonna be talking about all kinds of stuff. If you're sensitive to any of any kind of abuse, especially incest abuse, don't watch no more right now because this is this is where we're going. That was the defense, okay? The defense was basically about the boys being sexually abused by their father. And I'm not just talking about any of it is bad, okay? Any of it is terrible. But they gave, these boys gave the most detailed stories unimaginable. And it was a, it was a huge deal. Because of that, it ended up being a hang jury. All of the men voted for them to be charged for murder and all of the women ended up um, voting 
that they would not be charged with murder. And so it was a hang jury and they had to retry the whole entire thing. The defense exactly was that they were afraid that their parents were going to kill them because of all the abuse that had happened over the years. They had another trial in 1995. And in this trial, they were not allowed to talk about any of the abuse that they went through. And they were found guilty of murder. And they were sentenced both to life in prison without the possibility of parole. And that is where they are now, still to this day, for over 30 years. Okay, now that I got all that out, let me talk about how I feel about some things. First of all, if you guys watched the trial, and I will, again, I'm going to leave it linked down below. A lot of people thought that these boys or they were men at the time we'll get to that were lying about the abuse that they went through okay when I tell you guys abuse if you have not listened to this it is devastating the things that they say that their father did to them and I believe that I very much believe what they said that their father did to them and because it's way too detailed and the emotion is way too raw and as somebody like me who is very when you're talking about abuse and stuff like that like somebody like me too that's been through a couple things I feel like I can pretty much tell if you're like the 911 call to me when I heard the 911 call that sounded fake Okay, when I watch their emotions talking about what happened to them from their father in court, that was not fake to me. But a lot of people thought it was fake back in, you know, 1993. I don't understand why so many people thought it was unheard of because stuff like that happened back then. It happened back in the 80s whenever I was a kid. And let me tell you something, and I know some of y'all watching this knows exactly what I'm talking about. For the mom or the woman of the house to turn a blind eye... Honey, that happened all the time. All the time. That is not a shocker to me. So for people that think that a mother couldn't turn a blind eye, oh, it happens. I know true. I know that myself too. It does happen. So I do believe that their mother turned a blind eye. Now, in that, they said that they thought that they were going to kill them. I That's the part I don't believe. I don't believe that they really thought that their parents were going to kill them. I don't. I think that the trauma built up, you guys. If you hear what their dad did, I mean, their dad was literally... I'll give you guys an example. And I cannot, I just cannot believe that they, there's no way that they could have known to make up this stuff. And one part of it, Lyle starts talking about how their dad would tell them or tell him that in like the Greek warriors, like when they would go into battle, before they would go into battle, all of the men warriors would sleep with each other. He would uh, talk about the bonding between men, um, uh, going into battle or in competitions, mostly with regards to battle and history, and that uh, interaction and touching and um, uh, hugging, but also was throughout history was something that men that had gone into battle had done together. Had me read passages about it when I was six. He had history books um, with passages outlined, various battles and uh, strategy, but um, in terms of on this uh, subject, there would be particular passages about Greeks, um, soldiers having uh, had sex with each other before they went into battle as a way of bonding with each other so they have a stronger connection and he would talk about uh, the same thing with regards to uh, sports and uh, and he and I. He talked to me about, um, I don't know, what, they were like lecturers or traveling lecturers, professors, and, uh, and they would have arrangements with very close special students, young boys. Um, and they would have sex. They would touch each other. And did he talk about it with regard to fathers and sons? Uh, he talked about it with regard to our relationship as being very special and our family history uh, with first the firstborn and the father. 
and what was special about the relationship of the firstborn <coughs> and the father? That it was special and that uh, that was really all that mattered was the firstborn and that the sons should do what the fathers say and then they grew up and they, they become like the father and the father teaches them, molds them and uh, and someday me and my son do the same. I googled that to see if that was true and I'll be dang if that ain't true. And Lyle said that his dad was showing him books and I could just imagine him as a little boy and his dad is saying like, look, what we're doing is special. This is what warrior, warriors did before battle. This is what like, and showing him it in books. Of course the kid is gonna believe this is what I'm supposed to do with my dad. Like, I absolutely believe it. And like, he warmed those kids up. Like he, 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 stuck things in them to get them to a certain spot and then he went all the way with those kids and like I just like am mentally thinking about these little boys of how as little boys they look up to their dad and they think that he's a strong king and he's this businessman and yeah he's scary and yeah he's abusive but he has this special time with his boys and then they start growing up and then they start realizing how wrong that is and how that messes with your head dude I, I don't know man I don't know that's bad I, I can't, I can't, I just can't, I cannot imagine what that did to the, to them boys. I also told you guys that the mom resented the boys. Um, they said it in court right here. How old were you when you heard things like, I wish you were never born? So. <coughs> Seven. So they had their dad doing this situation, beating them down or whatever, and then they have the mom saying, you ruined my life. I never wanted to have kids. I hate you. Like, I, I don't know, you guys. When they searched the home, they found lists that the mom would write for the dad while the boys were gone. So I'll give you an example. She would literally keep lists of the things the boys did wrong. And what's the first thing on it? Um, number one. Yeah, I know. What oh. is it? Uh, at home, Eric would not eat on, I, I'm not sure what that word is, would not eat on time or tape. Okay. And number two is? At home, Eric would not go to sleep or get his pajamas on. And is it similar kinds of things all the way down? Yes. Eric didn't eat his food. Eric didn't put on his pajamas when I asked him. Eric didn't pick up his shoes. What mom does that? What mom writes a list out? Literally, they found lists, multiple lists that she was writing out so when the dad got home, he could beat the kids. Like, I don't know, you guys. That, that to me sounds like a mom even more that despises her kids like who would do that I get it like if maybe like once in a like every now and then if your kids just go in nuts and you don't want to forget things but like every day taking notes about your kids because another thing that they talked about in court they found pictures they found negatives of their sons where the dad was taking pictures of them without their heads showing but just the bottom parts with their genitals exposed photographs of you and your brother yes and what would the circumstances be in which he would take photographs he would take photographs of us um of um, our private parts. And would he have you come in and pose for these photographs? Or how would that happen? Uh, I would just, if we were in the showers or bathtub or changing, he would just he would just use the same camera that my mother used, and then he would come in, and take just a photograph or two, and uh, he wouldn't say anything, and then he would leave. And you guys, if you don't think that that is like, I don't, I don't get it. I'm a mom. I'm obsessed with my child. 
my children, especially Jaden, my little one, the one that's with me all the time right now. Like I want to do everything with him. I don't want him to go to school. If, if I had my choice, he'd be with me all the time. He is my buddy. But you want to know one thing that I don't do? I don't take naked pictures of him like that, of his genitals like that. Why? They found like all of these pictures and negatives that he had where he would literally just take his kids or lay them down or whatever. No head in the picture, but just like the chest down with like their area showing like what a sicko. The boys testified that he'd always want to take pictures of them when they were bending over naked and stuff like that. And if you just think that, okay, maybe that, oh, well, maybe he just liked taking pictures of his kids naked in that area. The neighbor testified and the boys testified this too, but the neighbor testified that when she came over to the house, that as a shock value, he put in a prano. You guys know what I mean? But it was underage people doing it. Do you remember the dinner party? Jose Menendez started showing you child. That's what really surprised me. Well, after dinner, that was their entertainment. You described it as racy, graphic video of children engaged in sex acts and how sick in the head do you have to be as a human as a man as a woman as anything to first of all even watch that stuff to even think about it to own a videotape and then to put it in in front of people in front of your wife and I mean like that's how sick this man was the boys would testify that he, they would just sit around and watch those when they were little kids, like eight years old, watch Pranos with their dad. Where did these films come from? My dad brought them home with other videos. And would you and your brother sneak and watch them or how would you see them? No, my, my dad would, we would just watch them together. With your dad? And... Like what dad sits around and watches that? And it was like stuff like gang R's and where like a woman would be riding a bike down the street and then like somebody would come out of the woods and snatch her off the bike and snatch her into the woods and a bunch of guys would jump on her and take advantage of her. Like, are you trying to raise little sociopaths? Because why would you put that in an eight or nine year old's little mind? Like, why are you programming them to be attackers? You know what I'm saying? Like, and so for people to really look at this and go, hmm, you know, uh, nope, nope, they didn't do anything to these boys. Yes, yes, he did. And the mom looked the other way. She just looked the other way. She popped her pills. She drank her drinks. She took her notes and she looked the other way. I also want to talk about like how back then, and I know this from experience too, and some of you guys probably do too. You just didn't talk about stuff like this. And if you did, people didn't believe you. And I will say that like people did not believe these boys back then. It was so bad. They became the laughing stuff. Saturday Night Live even did a skit on them crying. And let me tell you something. When you hear these guys testify to what happened to them, even to the point that the older brother Lyle testified to something that he did to his younger brother that his dad did something to him. He turned around and did that thing to his little brother. Why would they want to go and tell the world that? People were going, why didn't they say something sooner? I don't know about you guys, but I know men, grown men, that had stuff happen to them that would, that would never want to tell anybody. They would take it to their grave before they would tell anybody because of the embarrassment of it. Like, I don't know what it is. I feel like sometimes us women, we can talk about it easier than men, but especially these two guys and to the extent of what they did with their dad, they did not want to tell the world that. They didn't want to get up there and have to talk about it in detail. And then at the end of the day, they said they still loved their dad. Like how many of us have loved our abusers before? I don't know, you guys, man, it's, it was brutal. I was so in fear. I watched the boys testify, both of them, multiple times. And every time it's like I heard something new and I got more and more mad. Like, why are they in prison right now? Why are, literally, why are they in prison? Okay, because y'all are going to say because they murdered their parents. Okay, we're going to get there. I want to talk about Eric, the youngest one. Nobody ever helped this poor kid. I mean, he's obviously like almost 50 now, but I, I like, by the way, when they got these boys, do you know they did a mental evaluation on them and they found out that at 
at 18 and 21, they had the mental capacities of an eight and a 10 year old. Why didn't they just kind of like walk away or go to police or, or reach out to someone? They were, they were grown, they were adults. That's, Vinny, that is the number one question people ask me. They were 18 and 21, why didn't they leave home? The answer is the therapy experts uh, who evaluated that and told me that their emotional maturity was somewhere around eight to 10 years old. Jose and Kitty Menendez had made the brothers very dependent on them. They could not imagine walking out the front door of that house. Oh yeah, they had money, but their mentality was stunted. They could play sports, but their problem solving skills and the way that they thought about things and saw life was completely stunted by the things that they had been through. As a matter of fact, Lyle, who was the, you know, the, the protege to his dad, he was a bedwetter and started losing his hair at the age of 14. If that's not a sign that he's being abused at home, I don't know what else you guys need. You know what I mean? And the other little boy, Eric, he was a sleepwalker. His mom would come get him, snatch him while he was sleepwalking and still out of it, which is very dangerous, by the way, snatch him and take him into the shower with ice cold water to wake him up and then just leave him there. No cuddles, no nothing, no nothing like that, okay? As a matter of fact, Eric testified to a time that he had kind of backtalked to his dad and his dad took him and threw him through this glass thing. It made this loud noise and his mom got up. Oh my gosh, she heard this noise. She was like, oh my gosh, she came in there. Was your mother home when this happened? She was in the kitchen. And did Doe, did she respond to it? At first she jumped up, not knowing what happened. And then she saw it was just dad throwing me through the glass. So she didn't say anything. She saw, oh, it's just Eric. He just threw Eric through the, the glass wall or whatever it was, door, whatever it was. And she just went back in the other room. Like she thought, oh, maybe, maybe one of my thing, maybe one of my plates broke, but no, it's just my son. Like another thing about this case is remember how I told you guys the OJ Simpson trial, which mind you guys, if you guys want me to talk about that, let me let you know. I could get my grandma in on that because honey, my grandma has the whole entire trial taped. It's not on VHS because it was something else back then. It's some a track or something she got the whole entire honey she is one that'll tell you she wanted him to get off and she was so happy like oj simpson trial had happened around the same time and when they found him innocent there was a lot of people that was happy but there was a lot of people that was mad so it is said that because their trial was around the same time that there was no way that they could let them get off too because then there would have been complete you know uproar with these two different rich people that get away with murder now, what do I think actually happened? Here we go. I think that the boys talked about this in court. I think that they, they were so many secrets in that family. I mean, Lyle, the older one, he wore, started wearing a toupee at 14 because he was losing his hair and his dad didn't want anybody to see him without, you know, hair and he was embarrassed. His brother didn't even know he had a toupee on. Like, that's how much the secrets were in the family. There was a point where Lyle confronted his dad because he said he heard Eric and his dad in the room. And who did you think it was happening to? Eric. And did you do something about it? Yes. I talked to my dad. What did you say to your dad? I told him that I knew what was going on with him and Eric. And then I heard the noises and that I wanted him to leave Eric alone. Now can you imagine a brother in your hearing, whatever he was hearing of his dad and his brother? I think the trauma just built up. I think that possibly, because they're all talking about the parents were going to take them out of the will. Maybe they were. Let's just say they were going to take them out of the will and they were threatening them without the will threatening with taking them out of their will, and that's why they killed them. I think that they may have thought, after all you put us through, after all this, and now you're gonna leave us stranded, I mean, I don't know what they were thinking. But I think the trauma and the sexual abuse and everything that they went through built up, I do think that they went and bought the guns. I think that they wanted to kill their dad because they probably sat around and talked and finally talked and told each other, Oh my gosh, he did this to you for this many years. He did this to me. He did this to me. I think they just probably snapped, okay? 
And I think when it came to their mother, they did tell the therapist that they wanted to put her out of her misery. I think that they knew that as depressed as she was and how many pills she took and how much she drank that she just could not handle it without him. And I think that they really thought they were just gonna put her out of her misery too. I think that they loved their parents, even though everything that they had put them through. And you can love your abuser. It happens. And that's what I think happened. I think it was more of a like a snapped episode. And, and it is premeditated because they say that if you think about a crime even one minute before you do it, it's automatically premeditated. So I do think it was premeditated. I don't think they should have got life in prison for that though. And I know y'all are going to be like, girl, you something's wrong with you. I don't. I think that they should have got maybe five or ten years on like a mental facility. Because... Where, you know, the, the battered wife syndrome, when the wife finally snaps. And I know that they, they had something like that back then, but the judge wouldn't allow it because they were men. And he said, no, that's only for women. It's not for men. And men, the men back then just did not want to believe that a dad would do that to their son, which is crazy to me because males have been doing that to other males for forever, just like Males do it to women, women do it to males, you know, whatever. So, but again, then again, back then you just didn't talk about stuff like that. If something happened within the family, you sucked it up, you didn't say anything and you moved on. I don't know. So that's it. They're supposed to get a new trial this year, 2021. It is said that this new thing came out that if you were abused, um, whenever you committed your crime, then you can have a new trial. Because what happened, I, and I told you guys, when they had their second trial, that they didn't allow them to talk about the abuse, which they're, in my opinion, they didn't get a fair trial. They didn't. And I, I cannot believe they're still in prison for this. Those boys had a crappy life from the beginning. And everybody that see, not everybody, but so many people that see them go, they had everything they wanted. They had everything they wanted. No, they didn't. They had money. Money's not everything. Cars, houses, obviously it's not everything. Jose, their father, was a multimillionaire. He had a freaking mistress in New York. He had a mistress in Beverly Hills. He had a wife at home. He was known to pay for prostitutes, okay? And he was messing with his kids. It didn't matter how much money he had. That thirst that he had could not be quenched. So that ought to tell you right there, money money just ain't everything. The boys didn't have everything. They had it hard from the very, very, very start. They were raised by this monster. And now they're in prison. And it's just, it's devastating. I feel bad for them. We need to let them out. Let them out. So what do you guys think? Have you heard about this story? What do you think? Let me know in the comments section down below. As always, my loves, thank you guys so, so, so much for watching this video. You know you can stay and watch another one. I know this is a long one. I know you got a few more extra minutes. You can save it. You can come back to it later. <laughs> As always, please do not forget to like this video. It's a free way that you can help your girl out. And until next time, I love you guys so, so, so very much. And I'll see y'all in the next video. Bye. Love you guys. Bye.